So this gets wired this way, this gets pulled down just a little bit like that, this thing gets stuck. How are we doing? Good morning and welcome to ICTM. This is so cool. Oh yes, the problem couldn't be simpler. This is the stupidest possible way to start any talk because it is an unnecessary slide. If we continue to do what we've always done, ladies and gentlemen, Lo and behold, okay, so it's a great slide for getting everyone's attention. It's a great slide for starting class. It's a great slide for saying, why are you wasting my time with what we already know? If we continue to do what we've always done, then lo and behold, God, this is going to drive me crazy. I should have taken his, I should have taken his clicker. Then we'll continue to get what we've always gotten. Look at the power of my instruction. Look at how I say it. I say it again. I show it to you. And like so much of math instruction, it goes in one ear, out the other, because I don't have a picture. I don't have an example. I am just talking, 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 which is what happens in the vast majority of math classes. And then we wonder why we have a problem. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if we continue to do what we've always done, think about what your kids are doing today. Think about the mindless skills that are on the test that they are taking this very day. Think about how many kids in the state of Illinois and across the United States are doing a mindless opportunity to practice what they already know, learning nothing new, or practice what they do not understand and have no opportunity to learn it because all we do is worry about shut up, sit down, do 1 to 19 odd and get right answers. And so yes, it's Friday morning, it's early in the year, and already the body language in this room is perfect. I've got people who are sitting there going, yes, I fastened my seatbelt, oh great, this is so cool, I love what he's saying already. And the people sitting next to you are already sitting there, putting their arms together tightly because I have dared to assault the Holy Grail. I have dared to suggest the mindlessness of this kind of practice. For those of you who are not convinced, I give you the Pavlovian stimulus. If we continue to do what we've always done, then ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Pavlovian response straight from a Connecticut second grader's journal. If I were 100 years old, I would go to a nursing home, just like grandma. I would stay there until I was dead, just like grandpa. By the time I was 100, I would know regrouping with subtraction, and then I would die happy. <laughs> we all laugh because we recognize it. We all laugh because we know deep down that despite the fact that we're supposed to be warm, fuzzy, loving, caring, nurturing educators, so much of what we do puts kids' heads in vice scripts and basically elicits that kind of response. And where are we today? In a world of shut up, sit down, second graders who do not yet know much about place value, who don't yet know about their facts, are asked to shut up, sit down, and go and do this kind of stuff. Ready, set, brave new world, look at that. That's second grade. That's why this is Brave New World. That's why wherever we look, the Common Core State Standards are a chance for us to finally climb out of some of the holes that we've been in. Add and subtract within a thousand, second grade, three digit numbers, using concrete models. Excuse me, I'm not sure you understand what's going on here. The last five sets of Illinois State Standards in second grade said, Students will add and subtract numbers to 1,000 with and without regrouping. End. We told people what was required. We now live in a world where our standards are telling us not just what, but how, and giving elucidation, either as you're about to see, or with examples, using strategies, models, drawings, the relationship between addition and subtraction. What do you, what do you, what, how, properties? Relate the strategy to a written method. It doesn't say standard algorithm. It doesn't say the standard algorithm because this is second grade. This is a chance to play. This is a chance to build understanding. And then the standards have the audacity to say, in case it isn't clear to you, this big, powerful notion of adding and subtracting that forms the foundation for kids' self-concept about math in exactly the same way that subtraction with regrouping has systematically sucked life out of so many kids who didn't yet, weren't yet ready, we're told, by the way, understand that in adding or subtracting three digit numbers, one adds or subtract the hundreds to the hundreds, the tens with the tens, the ones with the ones, well, I knew that, but, and then sometimes there are too many or there aren't enough and we have to compose or decompose. Now, what I love about this is those of you who are as old as I am understand that we have moved from borrowing 
to regrouping, to composing and decomposing. I'm not sure that's really the, you know, the, the, the great advance forward, but it does suggest that this is brave new world. And once again, words, words, words. And we sit there and go, yeah, but so what? What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of that people don't have a chance to get their heads around this. I'm afraid that all we do is talk to each other about this stuff. Go. Let's go, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed mathematics teachers of the great state of Illinois. The answer is, oh yeah, 541, 541, 541. Oh, this is awesome. Raise your hands proudly if that's the way you did it. Oh, I rest my case. I mean, if we don't do it that way, then why the hell do we make kids do it that way? Stop and think about the absurdity of believing that the answer is the one right way to get the one right answer using the standard algorithm that doesn't exist. There is no the standard algorithm. And so the question is, if you didn't get 541 that way, then how the heck did you get it? And the discussion we need to have is, well, I sat there and did it, the Walmart, Stanley, Kaplan, McDonald's approach, and one, is 60 and then 40 more is five dollars and then five dollars and said ten perfect how many of you broke all the rules and started on the left yeah exactly come on the same people who sit there and say to kids God said this is the right way to do mathematics <laughs> the same people who sit there and say we are allowed to do division from left to right but that's special dispensation because we can only do addition subtraction and multiplication from right to left sit there and go screw you Right? I mean, that's what we do. We sit there and say, well, let's see, um, four from ten, that's six, but you got some stuff over here, so it's only going to be five. Oh, how interesting. And we can talk about all the different ways that we do it, and every one of those ways speaks directly to a strategy based on place value, or adding instead of subtracting, adding on, or all those ways that are effective, convenient ways to do it that make such a difference. You think the problem is only elementary? Come on, gang. Feast your eyes at the great separator killer of mankind. Talk to your brothers and sisters. Talk to your friends. Talk to your spouses and significant others. And you know that they hit the wall at Algebra 2. There it is. Look at the words. Look at the contexts. Look at the applications. Look at the modeling. So, I mean, yes, I grant you, I live a completely warped life, okay? I mean, I've already flown 109,000 miles on United just this year. It's ridiculous. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm now a 1K from the next year, earlier than ever before. Which means that I fly in first-class cabins next to some of the most amazing people in the world. I'm flying out of O'Hare eight months ago next to the director of engineering for Caterpillar. Now, I got my stuff and my manuscript and all that kind of stuff, so obviously I'm doing Algebra 2. And he looks and he goes, the hell is that crap? <laughs> Honest to God. I said, come on, you can't do that to me. You're the director of engineering. He says, no, really. He says, you're still teaching that stuff? He says, I'd fire anybody that used pencil and paper to do that. But you stop and think about how much of what we do is still grounded on in order for. 12% of humanity to do Newton's quotient by pencil and paper. We have to kill the human spirit in Algebra 1 and in Algebra 2 so that they can do what no normal human being on the planet does. And along comes the, oh, before the Common Core, page 2. Look at the magnificence of that. Ah, but you can't wait to dig in. Division, oh, I'm sorry. Does anyone believe that division of polynomials is one bit clearer this way than it is this way? <laughs> and, and why would we be dividing polynomials in today's world with pencil and paper? I'm mean, seriously, why? We need to recognize that we have been set up. We've set the kids up. It is time for us to stand up and say, we are still being asked to teach an increasingly obsolete, absurd curriculum, and we need to stand up and say, I won't do it to kids anymore. I won't take it. Why? Because, because that's what you've taught kids. I hope you're proud. <laughs> Damn, I love that X and Y, but Z just drives me crazy. Right? And then along comes the Common Core. 
And the Common Core sits there and says, oh yeah, by the way, okay, we'll take out matrices and secants, nothing else, that's a problem, right? And now add functions, oh, and models because they're indispensable, real modeling, not that other kind of modeling, and statistics because we know the statistics is far more important than any calculus if the society is going to survive, right? Persevere solving problems, and ladies and gentlemen, if you walk out of here with only one takeaway from this talk, I beg you, let it be that the nine words in the highest, largest font on the screen are likely to be the nine most important words in the entire 98-page document. I believe that construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others is the Trojan horse in the standards. When people say to me, help us revise teacher evaluation, I go very simple. I want every teacher of mathematics to be asked to do only one thing. I want to see in every single class, every day, kids constructing viable arguments. Because the only way they can construct viable arguments is if I ask them, why? How do you know? Where'd that come from? And the only way that I can get kids critiquing these arguments and critiquing reasoning is if, my God, I've got one kid holding it up on one whiteboard, I've got another kid holding it up on another whiteboard, I've got kids looking at it, I've got document cameras that are showing me the different kinds of work. In other words, all of the solving problems, the reasoning, the, the precision, all of that happens if in fact I just have a mindset that says, I have screwed my kids, I have not honored the Common Core State Standards, I have marveled that NCTM and all of its genius has never yet quite put on the table this amazingly powerful idea of the Trojan horse, the game changer, construct viable. Come on, gang, you heard from, um, from Deb Bob. I live halfway between the White House and the Capitol. Right, Elizabeth Warren lives upstairs from us. I mean, you know, you see her in the elevator and you just laugh. I mean, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. Okay, I mean, these are our former students. And we've not taught them the reason. And we've not taught them to think. And we all pay the price, whether you are as far left as I am or as far right as Ted Cruz. The bottom line is that the extremes are polluting things, and I'm proud to tell you that I've been polluting things. But we've got to find a way to talk about what is reasonable. And if we don't do it in math, then where the heck are we going to do it? And then, if we're going to talk about the most important practice, Allow me to suggest to you that everyone, starting with Jason Zimba, one of the writers of the Common Core, says that you are looking at 6RP3. It is likely that the single most important standard, content standard in the entire document, far more important than anything in high school, far more important than anything in algebra, is ratio and proportion. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, grade six, Illinois. Students will express a ratio as A to B, A over B, A colon B. Look at the depth. And then two, students will use ratios and rates to solve problems. That's all it said. We are now in a world where we have standards like we've never had them before. We now live in a world where it says use ratio and rate reasoning to solve real world and mathematical problems. For example, by reasoning about tables of equivalent ratios. What? Equivalent uh, tables, ratios, right? Tape diagrams, double number lines, double number line diagrams or equations. Then go make tables, then do problems like this, then do problems like this, then do problems like this. If you don't see that that is not a chapter, that is a quarter of sixth grade. That, that, that in fact we are talking about less is more in ways that mean something. You and I have one fundamental responsibility. You guys are the nuts. You guys are crazy. You come to an ICTM meeting on a Friday when there are a thousand and one other things you could do. You go back to the ranch on Monday next to people who think that you are a crazy human being. You go back to the ranch with people who are scared to death of you because you know something about teaching mathematics. You go back to the ranch with people who wouldn't come to this conference if their lives depended upon it. That puts a responsibility on you to sit there and say, hey, let's talk about this stuff. Let's go look at sixth grade. No, wait, let's look at second grade. No, wait, let's look at what this Common Core is doing. Let's look at where we are. Let's look at what pages in our textbook we need to skip. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't sit around as colleagues and say, what the hell does that mean? If we don't have videotapes, if we don't have videotapes to show what some of this looks like, then it's going to be just another typical disaster. Good morning, boys and girls. Where am I going? I can't hear you. Where am I going? That's right. I'm going to Florida. Why am I going to Florida? 
Yeah, I want a vacation. It's, it's warmer down there. I can't stand another Chicago winter. Exactly right. Wonderful. How fast am I going? Wonderful. How do you know I'm going 60 miles an hour? Dumbest kid in my class says it says so. Look at that. I start out just like I do in reading language arts with the simplest, obvious, literal comprehension problems. I got every kid, I got a table there. I say to kids, okay, tell me what you see. Let kids see I see a table. Kids say I see a chart. Kids say I see empty cells. Kids say I see a variable. Kids say I see 60 miles an hour in two different ways. Whoa. I have this brain dump. I have instruction that gives kids a reason to care. I sit there and go, all right, cool. So what number goes there? Oh, how do you know? Well, if I go 60 miles in one hour, then it looks like in two I'm going to be able to double it. How nice. So what number goes there? 120. Wonderful. I want to hear what goes to the right of 120. How do you know it's 180? Why is it that, in fact, I multiply this by 60? No, wait, 1 and 2 is 3. 60 and 120 is 180. Wait a second. You just added numerators and you added denominators. Well, yeah, because they ain't fractions. They're ratios. They're quantities. That's very confusing. That's right. That's why sixth grade may be the single hardest grade to teach. It's because these things are so amazingly confusing. These things are so tricky. I, even when I spend a quarter of the year on it, I'm still struggling um, with what's going on. But what do I care about? I care about script. So I've been working in Hazelwood, outside of um, St. Louis. Julie, last November, Sorry, last October is a Teach for America first year teacher. Julie is struggling. I go into the class because I've been at Hazelwood for two and three days a month for a year now. And um, she's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's not working. I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to do the things that I, you showed me to do back in August. And, and I just, I cannot remember to ask the right questions. Sixth grade, she's doing bits and pieces too. Connected math. It doesn't get any harder than that. And she's struggling. And I said, well, I don't understand. Why don't you just read the things? Glenda has put them into italics, so you just read them. She says, oh, are you, you can do that? She says, I don't want, I mean, the kids will think that I'm not smart, that I'm not going to read it. I said, you got your damn interactive whiteboard. Screw reading it. Go type them out. Go write them on. The kids won't know whether or not. I mean, I can't remember what to do. Look, what do you notice when you look from left to right? I script it out. I put the questions that I have here. I have the things from my teacher's guide. I walked back into Julie's room in November. She literally jumped into my arms. She said, I can't believe it. I put the things on my interactive whiteboard. They're on my slides, and I know exactly what to ask. And the class is like day and night. And you sit there and go, you think we can do this without coaching? You think we can do this? In fact, we maintain the isolation we have. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'll get it out of the way now. Big idea number one, look at the power of something as simple and as powerful as construct viable arguments, create the reasoning of others. Two, anyone that thinks we can do the magnitude of change we're talking about by ourselves is crazy. We have got to collaborate. Takeaway number two, if you go back next week and don't invite a colleague into your class, you have failed me and yourself. If you go back next week and don't invite a colleague into your class or go visit another class, you are not paying honor to what, in fact, we need to do as professionals, right? Top to bottom, within columns. And then after you have that observation, you guys go out to Starbucks. You guys go and sit in the principal's office. You guys bring in some wine and crackers. No, not wine. Cheese and crackers, right? And you have a discussion about what was cool, what was not cool, what was awesome, and all that kind of stuff. And then you make another appointment. It can't be done by ourselves, gang. And so look at what's possible and look at what happens. Oh. And then a formative assessment. So again, I mean, you know I'm warped. I am warped. I sat in 175 math classes during the 2012-2013 school year. I started in August of 2012 at Fort Schachter Elementary School in Oahu, and I ended up last June in Sam Schachter's class in Barrington High School in Barrington, Rhode Island. 172 math classes. Do you know what kind of a data set that is? I have already seen 34 math classes this school year in Phoenix, in Kip, New Orleans, and at the two schools, East St. Louis and at Jefferson Houston, as recently as Tuesday of this week, watching teachers teach, seeing Greg. Greg is 23 years old. Greg weighs about 240 pounds. 
Greg is a first grade teacher. Greg, as I walked into that classroom, is lying prone like a whale, like a beached whale on the floor with his 100% African American kids constructing numbers with cubes. I just sat there, took out ping, 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 ping. He says, you take pictures of me, are you? I go, no, I'm just the kids. I mean, the point is, I've just seen so much, and why am I telling you this? Five of those 200 classes ended with, okay, sit down, let's see if we've learned anything. We know the power of formative assessment, and so at this point I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. good, on your whiteboards, by yourselves, right? Suppose you went 640 miles, what's the question? What's the question? How long did it take? Good. What's the answer? Go do it. How do you know? Where did it come from? That tells me whether or not we've learned anything. And so, gang, what have we gotten? It's only fair that we acknowledge that despite amazing efforts, despite the dedication, the fact is the system is still not working well. We've got mountains of math anxiety, tons of mathematical illiteracy, mediocre test scores, high school programs that you know barely work for half the kids, gobs of remediation, a slew of criticism. It really is a mess. And so if, however, there it is, the bookend. If what we've always done is no longer acceptable for all the reasons that we understand, and if we have this thing called the imperfect holy grail, the common core state standards, then ladies and gentlemen, we have no choice. We really don't. If we're going to serve kids and make this a better society, we have to stop and say this is not a fad, this is for real. That in fact it's not going to go away. That states may be moving away from the park and smarter, uh, not smarter balance yet, but away from park in some ways, although it's not disappearing either. No state is moving away from the Common Core itself. They're trying to do it in Wisconsin now, they're going to fail. They try to do it in other places. The fact is, anybody that looks at where we were and where we are sees that it would be crazy. And we actually have the business community on our, on our side. And so we have no choice but to change some of what we do and a whole lot of, of, of how we're going to do it. And you need to sit there and say, blah, 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 show me. What, what does different mean? Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Oh, the oxygen is just flowing. Boys and girls, tell me what you see. No, 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 no. Tell the person sitting next to you five things you see on my, on my board. I do what gifted teachers do. I do open-ended. I do divergent thinking. Come on, tell the person five things. I don't hear people talking. I see this, I see that, I see this. Wonderful. You ready? Here we go. Ray, Sh excuse me. You need to listen. Ray. Well, I see four over there on the right hand side that's hooked with 40 and 30, and I don't understand because 40 should have been four, and now four is 30. And, I and you know that you have kids who are going to sit there and do this. Well, I'm going to see the four, but the four is seven, and the 40. I don't understand why there's a four with a 30, and it should be like a four with the other thing, and it's not, and all that kind of It's wonderful. Peter, what'd you see? Don't worry, Sal, I won't call on you. I saw numbers going down and then back up. Oh my God, down and going back up. Four, two, and then back up, right? Good. What'd you see, ma'am? I'm behind you. What'd you see? Blue. You see blue, exactly. There is all. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. I don't know why. If you're going to do this in the real world, you know that, and I write it down, I see blue. What's blue, I might say, and she says there are two different shades of blue in those stripes. It's really cool. In fact, there are three shades, but I don't think that light one is really blue. And you laugh and all oh, Stephanie, what'd you see? I saw a table. I saw a table, exactly. Did anyone else see a table? Wonderful. Who saw a chart? What's the difference? And now I'm doing vocabulary. Now I'm doing what, in fact, good instruction says, right? I do a brain dump. Kids tell me I see numbers. I see six numbers. Actually, that 18 on the bottom is a page number. I now see seven numbers, right? I see numbers on the left. I see numbers on the right. Good. The numbers on the left are all? They're all? Good. They all end in zero. They're all even. They're all? Multiples of 10. Good. And now I start saying, convince me they're multiples of 10. Convince me they're all even. Convince me that, in fact, it's a chart. It's a chart. It's a table. It has cells. 
convince me there are empty cells. Kids see the blue, kids see the page number, kids see a sentence and a question. What sentence? Some data. Is that a sentence? No, that's a bad period there because there's no verb in that. Oh my God, what are you doing, Mr. L? This is math. Now you're doing English. No, I'm doing life. I'm asking you, what do we do in gifted classrooms when we sit there and talk about what you see? Wonderful. Boys and girls, I got great news for you. There's more data. Of course there's more data. There's all those empty cells. So, tell a person sitting next to you, what number goes under the 30 and what number goes under the 4? Construct viable arguments. Do what most of you in this room despise me asking you to do. Come on, can we be honest? We teach mathematics. We know that mathematics is the land of deductive and inductive reasoning. We know that we have common core practices. Reason abstractly and quantitatively. And I ask you a reasoning question, you go, eh, screw you. You do. Ready? Tell the person sitting next to you what number goes under the 30 and what number goes under the 4. Awesome! So, <clears throat> so we that's right. Once you open the spigot. The beautiful thing. This is great. My turn. I don't really care. At 9 o'clock I'm done. Whether I get through it or not, it makes no difference. It's cool. Okay? I don't care. I've already covered enough. Excuse me. So look at what happens when we open the spigot. It is October. It is not too late in the year to start doing these kinds of things, right? And so I've got kids that sit there and say, Don, 20 and 2. Why 20, Don? Oh, look at this. Down 30, up 20, down 30. Perfect. 20, 2. Ah, 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 ah. A, B, A, B. Now the kid sits there and says, I agree with the two because those are just even numbers, right? But in fact, 10 minus, 40 minus 10, 40 minus 30, plus 20 minus 30. No, that's the same thing. 40 minus 10 is 30. 10 minus 30 is minus 20. Oh. No, wait a second. It's 20, but because it's the missing number. No, wait a second. This is 80 because it's the... And this is 10. What else would you put on the bottom? Actual retail value? Look at how you care. You've invested in it. Nobody cares. Oh. Oh. Oh my God, look at that. Three. Where did three come from? What's going on here with this three? Good. Would you like to see more data? I'll give you the whole... Co oh my God. Boys and girls, the numbers on the left are all... Look at that. Ten minutes ago, you did not recognize, in most cases, that these guys were multiples of ten because ten was a factor. Because all numbers at ten is a factor end in zero. Now you look at this column and you sit there and go, hey, I know, I know. They're all multiples of? Convince me. Oh, construct viable arguments. Convince me. Write it down on your whiteboards. Wait a second. Call it out. Know in your groups who's going to be the spokesman. In other words, we're in a world where they are doing more of the talking. I'm doing a terrible job of modeling this because I'm racing through what should take me 45 minutes. But you get a sense of the way the questions, the way in which we script it, the way we have to do this collaboratively because none of us are smart enough to do this by ourselves. So, gang, Numbers on the right are no longer all even, but they're all one-digit numbers. I might ask if I'm really weird, where am I? But instead, I'm going to tell you where I am. Oh, sort of. Where am I? I can't hear you. Where am I? The, muse the amusement park. No, I'm not. I'm at the carnival. No, I'm not. I'm at the fair. No, I'm not. I'm at Disneyland. Oh, great. Who's right? No, oh, exactly. And boys and girls, yell it out. What word goes over roller coaster? What word goes right there in that blue stripe? Ride. Oh, cool. Your turn. You see, we talk about inferential reasoning, and yet we don't ever do it. Look at this reveal. 
we have all these gradual release of responsibility, gradual release of understanding, gradual, well, this is gradual release. This is taking our tools, our PowerPoint slides, starting with the whole thing, and then taking pieces out and working backwards to create this opportunity to say, on your mark, get set, reasoning, thinking, being prepared to do what this world needs in a world where all of the trivia is done by calculators and computers. Where I need kids to understand concepts. Where I need kids who can sit there and say, I know, I know, the numbers on the left, you have one minute. What replaces the question marks? Go. There's nothing more wonderful than kids thinking and reasoning mathematically and having problems bringing them back together. Ready, sit, I want to volunteer. Eileen, what do you got? Some volunteer. The number on the left is? How long you wait in line? In hours, right? And the number on the right is? <laughs> what, what, did I say something wrong? Oh, in minutes. In the KIPP schools, they have a ritual called push back, push back, push back. Do any of you know that? That's a Teach for America thing, right? You have the kids, when you do something wrong, instead of you're wrong, you're a jerk, you're a moron, it's push back, push back, right? It's really cool. So the teacher purposely makes a mistake, like hours. The kids go, push back, push back. I go, did I do something wrong? And the kids go, we don't think you'd wait there for hours because you don't have a tent in a sleeping bag. So it's minutes. And the number on the right is? how long the ride is. So you have a very clear sense of how much time you'd have to waste to get a few seconds of thrill and we can create those ratios. That's great, that's not what it is. Number on the left, number on the right. Well, you laugh, okay, but you start with your brightest student and you just sort of go, chop, nice, cool, but... What do you think it is? You guys were talking. The number on the left is? I said the same thing. The same thing, good, that's always safe. The number, no, no, excuse me. The biggest number on the left is the biggest number on the, and the biggest number in that column. And, and what does it correspond to? And the biggest, next biggest number? And that corresponds to Oh, and the smallest number on the left is and that corresponds to we have an important name for that. If in fact Congress understood that that notion of little with little, big with big, or little with big and big with little is called begins with a C called correlation. In fact, if I graph them out, it's sort of linear, big with big. Well, look at the big numbers. The big numbers are on the most popular rides. So it is a scoring scheme. No, wait a second. It is the number of miles per hour that the ride goes. No, wait a second. This is how many um, pounds you have to weigh, and this is how many feet tall you have to be. No, wait a second. Help me. The number on the left. Randy? The number of people in line, exactly right. And the number on the right is how many of those people fit in each car? Two on each horse in the merry-go-round. No, that's not what you thought. No. So what do you, how many cycles it takes before all those people are done. So you actually have the sign that says the ride needs to read, run once and you'll get on the next time or twice. It's like yesterday at DC. Okay, we're number three on the runway. It was really cool. And so you have that same sense. Good. Kids tell me the number on the left is how many people fit on the ride. The number on the right is how many of those people on average puke each time. <laughs> you laugh, but I've never seen a class of kids want to do division as quickly as the kids to do the division to find out that the merry-go-round has the highest puke rate. And the question is, how could that be? I am critiquing arguments. I am using the kids, no gang. I am recognizing that. What? the common core practices do is it asks us to turn every one of our classes into a gifted class. So I'm sitting at South Barrington High School in Barrington, uh, sorry, South Burlington High School in South Burlington, Vermont last year. We're doing this big Nellie Mae study of exemplary math teachers and we're trying to differentiate very good teacher-centered but underperforming and very good student-centered and overperforming. I'm in Jeff's class. Jeff teaches AP Stat, AP Calculus in the, middle of the, in the beginning of the day, of course. And then I'm in his class of 13 special ed ninth graders. The kids 
Were it all in the room, the bell hadn't rung. He's got Ken Ken on his board. I'd never seen it. These kids, you walk, everyone, and you go, oh my God, you can't teach these kids. Give them a worksheet. Just bury them somewhere. And he sits there and goes, way, look at that. Ken Ken. He says, which number can you put in? How do you know? The kids all say, we put the three in because the three. He says, yeah, what does that mean for the rest of the row? And the kids go, one, two, four. He says, and the four go here? No, of course they can't go four because it's plus three. What, what does that mean? It's one and two. Do you know where the one? He says, oh, that's great. Now, you guys fill, fill in this row. Now, you guys, that's reasoning. That's kids who are doing Ken Ken and feeling good about themselves. And then he turns to a complicated spreadsheet and he says, screw the curriculum. My job is to have you understand that the world runs with spreadsheets and we're going to spend the next two weeks learning how to use spreadsheets. I sat there with my mouth agape. I want to videotape that and show the world what is possible. I want to remind us that we get so hung up and sucked into preparing kids for tests that we forget what life is all about. And so gang, at this point it's almost that, yeah. Look at that. It is the number of minutes you have to wait. It is the number of tickets. And all, oh, this is so, yeah, that's right. Dumbest kid in my class. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to the Smarter Balance website, if you look at the emerging park performance tasks, what you see is they start with some scaffolding. And then they move to more complicated data-driven things. You cannot just blop these things on kids' heads. I just modeled what I think is reasonably good instruction using the reasoning, the questioning, and what do you know, and uh, to get to the point where, hey, boys and girls, the fourth and the second graders at your school are going to amusement park. Oh, they can't wait. In fact, we're going to be buddied up. Our fourth graders are going to be buddied up with the second graders, and you have a buddy who really wants to go on every single ride. However, there may not be enough time, and we may not have enough tickets. In fact, the bus drops us off at 1, picks us up, uh, drops us off at 10, picks us up at 1, we all get 20 tickets. Boys and girls, your mission, whether you choose to accept it or not, is to write a letter to your buddy describing an awesome day at the amusement park and attach a schedule. 10 o'clock, bus arrives, bing, ding, ding. Where do you go? How long? What time? What time? What ride? All those kinds of things. Oh my God, the parents love this. 7, 8, 9, da, 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 20. My kid has to choose the little spoiled brat. They don't have enough tickets to go on every ride. They don't have enough time to go on every ride. Dear buddy, I hope you're as afraid of those scary rides as I am. If not, you may want to find another buddy. Here's my plan. While all the other kids are wasting their day online, we're going to take our 20 tickets and ride the merry-go-round 10 times. <laughs> With the 80 minutes we have left, we are going to pig out at the concession stand with the 10 bucks my mom is inevitably going to give me. Your buddy, Steve. And you just sit there and want to hug that kid. And so, gang, why? Why did I spend all that time on that task? Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, this whole revolution, this whole next step, this whole progression from an agenda for action that when you read it now, you just sit there and go, look at how far we've come and look at how far we haven't come. And you read the 89 Common Core State Standards and you the good, the, that's really Freudian, the 1989 NCTM Curriculum and Evaluation Standards, and you see the, the, the progress. And so you know that we've made great progress. That's because Steve and Zal and I had dinner last night, and I promised Zal that I wouldn't be a complete radical, that I would acknowledge how far we've come with the understanding that we all know how far we still have to go. You know the gap between this vision and what happens in the modal classroom. I started with this gang because standards don't teach. Don't let the morons ram that stupid story down your throat. Teachers teach. If we teach, the standards are only guides. And if we teach, then it says that our job is to work collaboratively to translate those words into the tasks and the instruction and the assessments, and that's what really matters. Why do I do this? Because if you don't see that the processes, the reasoning, the problem solving are as important as any of the content, if you don't recognize that 
You sit there teaching polynomials. You sit there doing long division of three digit numbers for no possible reason. And the question is, you sit there and the kids know you're bored to death. The kids know you can't apply it. We need to give ourselves as well as the kids a reason to care. And I do this because as I've, as I've said three times, anyone that thinks that this is easy, anyone that thinks that we can do this alone, anyone that doesn't understand that we need to build collaborative structures is absolutely crazy. And so allow me to sort of provide you with four perspectives on our reality and move to hopes and fears and, and challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is an amazing time. This is the 2013-2014 school year. This is the year before Park takes over our lives for better or for worse. This is the year where whoever believed it would take off like wildfire. This is, this is a time when if you don't see the access we have, I mean, we've got access to ideas and materials on the web we've never had before, right? We've got a president who believes in science and data, whether you love him or hate him or feel sorry about him. I mean, it really is amazing. We've got the end of Algebra 2 as the killer course gradually emerging if we finally do it right, right? There's this long overdue understanding that it's instruction, instruction that is the heart of the matter. How could we? the Illinois Council of Teachers of Mathematics not keep teaching front and center and this recognition that the United States doesn't have all of the answers. And so, gang, here's an advanced organizer. You go online to NCTM, you click on Principles to Actions. It is a draft. NCTM Principles for Actions is a, is a draft, public review draft. It'll come out in, um, in New Orleans in April. I have been honored to chair the writing committee. It is an imperfect draft, as all drafts should be. But what everyone who reads that agrees upon is where we've hit it out of the park is the section on teaching. And CTM has not attacked teaching since the 1991 teaching standards. And in this document, there is a chance for us to say, so, not only do you establish learning goals, but are they meaningful learning goals? Are they more than just a skill? Are your mindsets about what you're teaching? More than just an answer. Implement challenging tasks. The operative word, implement, do them challenging, they have to have heft, and they need to be tasks that would give kids a reason to care. Connect and use representations so that we have, how did you see it, how did you see it, how did you see it? Every one of these has a seven or eight page set of examples, of commentary, and of tables and charts. Pose purposeful questions. That's what great teachers do. Facilitate meaningful discourse. Talk about it. How do you know? There's nothing radical here except that if every math teacher's teacher evaluation was based around these seven things, and then elicit and use evidence. And so when I say to you, finally, there's an understanding that it's not the standards, it's the teaching, that the standards are guidance, and that we have this amazing set of resources, resources for defining what we ought to be doing, and resources that so many of you know some of Dan Meyer's lessons. Many of you know that so, Boys and girls, which one has more Coke, left or right? On your mark, get set. One on the left has got more soda. They have the same amount of soda. The one on the right has more soda. Awesome. Half of you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. OK, think about that. Hold up a mirror right now and ask yourself, if you wouldn't raise your hand right now where it's totally safe and totally anonymous, then you know damn well you won't take risks with kids. I'm sorry, it's not my job to be nice and smooth and, and ugly. It's my job to assault you for your typical unwillingness to take a risk. When I'm asking you to recognize, you ask every kid in your class to take a risk and take risks every minute of every day. You call on a kid, you don't care, you just call on him. That's what we do. And then we make it safe. Ready? You had a chance to think about it. Which is more? One on the left. They're the same. Awesome. The one on the right. Oh, and I still have people that won't raise their hand, but it's OK. So what do we need to know? Well, I don't know. What do you need to know? Now that I've got you hooked into this, you need to know that, in fact, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. This is just ridiculous. This is supposed to work. There it is. And so I'll come back to this. There you guess what information is important. Oh, I know what I have. There it is. Oh, what else? 
By the way, what is that? What is that? Yeah, that's a diameter. That's a measurement. That's centimeters. Good. How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? You tell me right now you don't want to take out that formula. You tell me right now you don't want to take out your calculator. You tell me right now you don't care why you guess. You want to know. You think they're the same, but I'm not sure they're the same. I don't know. Let's go see. Oh, my God. Dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum. Dum, 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 dum. Ah, yes, I've got about 20% of the class sitting there going, yeah, I knew it. And the rest of you going, something's wrong here, right? <laughs> now you want to go back to the math. I'm not sure you understand that what I'm showing you is available on Dan Meyer's website. I'm not sure you understand that, that in fact, we have websites, we have access to these kinds of things, right? We have the ability to now do things that basically allow us to recognize that, right? That it is an amazing, um, back way, it is an amazing time, sorry, amazing time to be teaching mathematics. And I'm going to cheat you, and I'm not going to give you the pep talk. Instead, I'm going to remind you. It is not worth our time and our attention if we don't understand that the bottom line is we're being asked to do something we've never done, been done before. We're being asked not to just ma make math work for the honors kids, the top 30%. We're not being asked to move math up to 50%. You and I are being asked because the society demands it to make math work for 80 or 90%. We're being asked to see to it that every single kid is mathematically college and career ready. We're being asked to do something that's never been done before and there's no existence proof. We've never been able to do it. There's no roadmap. A whole lot of people don't even believe it's possible, including people in this room. It follows, if you allow me to use an ounce of logical deductive reasoning, that if in fact we're being asked to make math work for more kids, if we're being asked to serve a much broader population or proportion of students, well, gang, there ain't no way to do it unless we teach it in distinctly different ways, different ways from how we were taught. And again, the collaboration. Again, the visiting each other's classrooms. Again, the videotaping. So here we go. It is now October 18th. Raise your hand if a colleague has watched you teach in a non-supervisory role this school year. Look around the room, gang. 10%. Raise your hand if you've watched a colleague teach in a non-supervisory role. Nice, so look at that. It's not reciprocal, we're up to 20%. That means that 80% of you haven't watched a colleague teach. 80% of you haven't seen a colleague come in. You've not benefited from the fact that you need another set of eyes. How many of you have been coached by somebody you trusted and respected this school year? There we go, we said the same 20%. You can't call that a profession. You have to recognize that that means we've got to do some things differently. And again, there's no existence proof. And so, gang, how do I do this sensibly? I do this sensibly. Oh, this is great. It's time for a new clicker. I have three of them in here. There it is. So, so what is it that, that I think you need to walk away from? Or walk away from this with? I think it's important that we pause and say, we are really at an amazing opportunity. You saw some of the standards. You saw what they can look like. You've seen the way the world is now conspiring in the best possible way to give us aligned, high-quality resources and materials, mainly on the web. But if you don't recognize that K-8 is fewer, clearer, and higher, if you don't recognize that 912 still sucks and that we've been screwed again, yeah, I just think that it's important that we understand the Common Core are not monolithic. K-8 are magnificent in my way of thinking. K-8 are truly fewer. K-8 are teachable. K-8 have moved things in the right way. K-8 is built upon progressions. K-8 helps us see fractions that are sensible in third grade, growing to difficult but sensible, and enough time in fourth grade to fifth grade. Division of fractions is now in sixth grade, where it always should have been, not in fifth grade, where it just warps brains. And then bingo, 912. Total different structure, not fewer, not intellectually benchmarked. No other country in the world does algebra one, geometry, algebra two. It's, it's, it's a problem that we have to deal with. But 
a sequence that gets all kids into rational algebra like most of the rest of the world. It doesn't talk about complex numbers and quadratics in eighth grade, but it talks about functions in ways that every kid needs to have handles on and access to no matter where they're going to go. And allow me to suggest once again, you can't do it all. NCTM has been talking for years and years and years about problem solving, reasoning, communication, connections, and representations, right? The Common Core says, well, that was so easy, let's just do eight. Oh yeah. Notice there are bold and there are unbold. I believe that as important as precision and tools and structure and constant, I mean regularity is, miss that one. You didn't miss it? You don't think it's funny? It is funny. God darn it. That last one about... I don't want to get into that. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. I don't believe that I have any right to impose these in the short term. I know they really can't be assessed very effectively. I know that these are non-negotiable. I know that if every class I walk into, these are beginning to emerge or are emerging in some fashion or are in place, I have opportunity to learn. I have a class that's making sense. And so once again, I worry about overkill. I worry about the fact that people are now saying the Common Core is the Bible. It is the Quran. It says it and therefore it has to be done. The two banes of my existence are TSA. Okay? Even with my pre-check status, I still find it impossible. And now at Dulles, the pre-check line is so damn long, it's ridiculous. But regardless, TSA, Transportation Safety Administration, is really not as onerous to me as the other TSA. The mistake made by the writers of the Common Core as a bone to the mathematician, the standard algorithm. I beg you, there is no standard algorithm. There are uh, several appropriate algorithms and we need to recognize how important that is, but that's a different talk. And so where does this take us? It takes us to dream with me, gang. Think about assessment as a process for gathering evidence and not simply sticking it to students. Think about assessment that in fact the results come back in a short period of time. This is smarter balance, not park. You lose on this one in the short term. Think about three-week testing windows. Think about the fact that we have computer-scored constructed response items that you can go and look at online, that you can see what's coming and what's happening. Think about these item banks so that we can construct our own formative and benchmark assessments that are aligned with the standards and have some modicum of quality. And think about getting results back in a very short days and weeks at most period of time. Dream with me about our reality, driving this system by high quality assessment. Go. There it is. That's a model park, smarter balance task drawn from Hong Kong, right? What do I want? I want every third grader. In fact, this is a fourth grade standard in the United States. That's fine. But think about your own kids, your nephews, your nieces, your grandkids. Think about the fact that they sit at a computer screen and all they have to do is click and drag those symbols into those boxes. Think about the conceptual stuff. Zal's talks are about the 200 and what's the right number? 87 times the word understand appears. It used to be verboten to put understand in a standard. Sal's amazing talk and stuff is about how many different ways the word understand gets used and the different meanings of them. But you know that I have some modicum of understanding when I've got kids that do not think that 10 over 10 is 10 and 1 is 1. Then they understand that there's an equal sign. You know how many kids think that 1 fifth is less than 1 eighth because 5 is less than 8? I have understanding about what's going on. I have the ability to see common numerators and those things. Ladies and gentlemen, don't tell me we can't do reasoning. Here's the measurement reasoning. Container A is filled completely. Look at that A. I pour it all into C. C doesn't get filled. I take C, I dump it into B and it overflows. On your mark, get set, click and drag, A, B, C, no, type in A and B and C to show me which is the largest, which is the medium, which is the smallest. A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, B, A. Answer, biggest one is C, smallest one is because it overflows with the same volume of water. How nice. And why? 
I'm not going to tell you that we need to fear China the way we used to fear Japan. I'm not going to sit here and say that Singapore has all the answers. I think that if you read Amanda Ripley's new book, The Smartest Students in the World, and you see what goes on in Korea, it's enough to make you puke. The foreign exchange students that she uses to interview, it's an amazing story. And it talks about the things that we could learn from Finland that we don't ever talk about in the policy arena. But ladies and gentlemen, if the bulk of the kids in China are expected to graduate from high school, according to weather forecast, the probability that there'll be a small flood someplace next month is 25%, one in four. And the probability of big flood is 0.01. Suppose that there is a piece of large-scale equipment on a construction site, and well, there are three plans. Boys and girls, plan one, remove the equipment, get it the hell out of there, don't worry about it, it only costs you $3,800. Yeah, but maybe that wasn't so smart if, in fact, the small flood isn't that costly. Construct a wall. It costs $2,000 for the wall, but it can't stop the big flood. When the big flood comes, your equipment is destroyed and you're out $60,000. Oh, come to the United States of America. Plan three. No plan at all. Hope the hell no plan will come. When there is a big flood, you lose the $60,000. When there's a small flood, you lose $10,000. If you don't understand that this is expected value, if you don't understand that we are diminished as a society when we spend all this time with polynomials and not with this kind of expected value and probability that's built into the common core, if you don't understand that that is part of the changing in what is valued, if you don't understand that in fact that is part of the problem we have as a society, that there are too few people that understand how to do that, how to use that, how to make sense of it. And so, my time's up. My time is up, and so I'm going to simply tell you that I worry a lot. I worry that, in fact, the chiefs and the governors said, here are your standards, go do them. We need some support. I worry that it's another fad and the political intrusion is going to become a nightmare. I want to take Jim Milgram and Sandra Slotsky right now and flush them down the toilet and you can tell Jim I said that. I think we worry about being doomed by the same lack of capacity that got us into this particular position in the first place. My discussions with Gates and Broad and Kaufman and all those things is stop pissing money away and give us the money to have high quality trained coaches that are voted on every year by the teachers they coach. Give me a rational plan, or I'll give you a rational plan, you give me the money, and let's recognize that it's about cap capacity. I worry about assessment compromises. If we lose those performance tasks, we lose the whole thing. I worry we don't have enough time, and I worry we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, what I spend most of today doing, I worry we forget that it's instruction, stupid and that we ignore the essential roles of our school culture and our school departments. Yeah, there's so much to be hopeful about. You saw what we're hopeful about. And so, ladies and gentlemen, because you have a very full day, and I have bombarded you with lots to think about, I wish you a great conference, a great school year, and I thank you.